So today, now we're going to listen to Rick van der Vliest, who is going to talk us about balancing the electricity grid with multi-level forecasting models. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Rick. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Today, we're going to talk about the electricity grid and uh, what we do at SimPower uh, to keep that in balance. So first, a little bit about myself. I have a background uh, in electrical engineering, then sh surely, slowly shifted kind of to our signal processing, then did some data science with uh, energy disaggregation and sustainability advice. And I'm a machine learning engineer at SimPower. Um, so for me, it falls really kind of like full circle of coming from electrical background into data science, but still uh, being somewhat connected to electricity. The agenda for today is going to be three parts. Every good presentation has three parts, right? First, a little bit of a primer about the electricity gr grids and all the things that you don't think about when you put your uh, plug into the power socket. Then something about the different kind of time series that we're facing and maybe how you can reason about what kind of time series you're dealing with. And then forecasting at different levels and how you can have reconciled or coherent forecasts across those. So let's start with the um, primer. You've already heard this a million times al already. There's a uh, energy transition, renewable energies, and uh, just a bit of show of hands, who here has solar panels on their roof? And who has, uh, is driving an electric car? And maybe a new category, new kid on the block, who has a heat pump at home? That's great. I see a lot of people are doing a, a great job already with the energy transition. And you're also part of the problem that we're creating in the electricity grid. So uh, no blame. That's all part of uh, the problem we need to solve together. So what's the problem? We're having a shift on the production side from coal, gas, oil-fired plants to renewable energies. They have more volatility, and they're less predictable. And we have more congestion, because there's also a lot of lo localized production, right? And on the other side, there's the EV, there's the heat pumps, there's a lot of electri electrification of the demand as well. So how do you keep everything balanced? Because if you have an electricity grid, it's different from ga gas or water, right? Or other commodities. You can just put them in a storage and keep them around for a while. Electricity, that's really hard. So how do we make sure that the consumption always equals the amount in the electricity grid? Because this is kind of a hard constraint that we have in the electricity grid? The answer is markets. So there's a lot of different electricity markets. Um, and there's a difference between trading markets and balancing markets, which we'll get to in a bit. So here you see some of the trading markets, right? So every day for the next day or during the day for the next hour, there's a market where you can say, I can supply this much against this price. Um, and you can say, I want to buy electricity against this price. And this is your classical economic supply demand find the intersection, and that's going to be the price, and that's going to be the volume. Um, also important, when we, so this is how, this is the agreement that you say, right? I will consume this much. As if we as consumers, we don't do that, right? So big commodity suppliers do that for us, but if you have a really big factory and you're using hundreds of kilowatts or megawatts, then you're also doing this, because it doesn't make si sense to always have a fixed price. Now what happens if we have this increased volatility, less predictability, and we're just having a little bit less sun today than we were expecting tomorrow, and there's an imbalance. Some of the supply that we were expecting suddenly falls away. And actually, the way that we can measure how much balance there is in the grid is by the grid frequency. So you can think of it as like a big spinning wheel. All the producers are kind of like trying to advance the wheel, make it spin faster, and all the demand is taking energy. So at the moment you have a surplus 
of supply, then the frequency goes up, and if you have too much demand, it goes down. So to do this kind of like response to disturbances, there's the balancing surfaces. So again, the solution is we'll just make a new market for the balancing service. There's a lot of different markets out there. You can see them on the slide. I don't expect you uh, at the end of the talk to know all, uh, all the services. But basically, whenever there's a deviation in the frequency, which you can see up top, somebody needs to respond, right? Because other, if we don't respond to frequency deviations in the grid, we're going to end up with a grid collapse because a lot of things depend on this 50 hertz on the grid. So there's some for a slow response, middle response, longer response, different response times, different uh, intensity. But basically, balancing responsible parties can bid and say, OK, I have 10 megawatt or 100 megawatt that I can turn off or on whenever there's a deviation. And this is what we trade in in the balancing market. You don't trade in the energy, but you trade in being available or being standby to respond whenever there is a deviation. So if you want to make a bid, you have to say how many megawatts do I have available and what price do I want to be uh, standby. So this is also, again, getting back to the whole energy transition. This balancing responsible party, traditionally, it's a lot of the producers, right? So you have a coal or Again, a gas powered, uh, powered plant. And traditionally, you'd have a lot of load following. So whenever demand goes up or down, you just scale up your load up and down. And that way, you can respond to frequency deviations. Now, what we're trying to do with SimPower, and what you see more and more, is to also have demand side flexibility. So instead of only the producer going up and down and trying to match whatever the demand is, you can also say, hey, if we have too much solar energy all of a sudden, maybe we can turn something on that's consuming that energy, or other way around, if there's a sudden high demand, maybe some of the big producers can also shut down. So um, this is what we're trying to do, finding big customers that have a really high electricity consumption and that could benefit by being in this balancing market. So imagine you're um, a big resource like a greenhouse. You have the lights on for most of the day. Um, and maybe every once in a two weeks, you get, all of a sudden you get an alert saying, okay, the frequency is uh, out of balance now. You need to turn off the lights for 10 minutes. And the plants, OK, the plants, they, don't, they won't suffer that much if you put the lights off for 10 minutes over a two-week period, right? So this is the business that SimPower is in, finding industries that have some potential for the side flexibility, installing some hardware, and then every now and then there will be a signal, signal everything needs to shut down now for 10 minutes or it needs to ramp up for 10 minutes, and then bringing that together as a big pool into the balancing market. So um, you came here also for data and forecasting and time series forecasting. So how does this whole energy transition story relate to forecasting? Well, we as an aggregator need to make a bid saying we're going to have x megawatts available tomorrow on standby. To know how much we have available, we need to know what electricity consumption there is. So say if you have a greenhouse which is operating at 500 kilowatts, but they have some additional lamps that they can turn on, they can scale up to a megawatt or they can scale down to zero watts. So they have like 500 kilowatts of flexibility in every direction. If we want to forecast that, that means we need to forecast the power consumption of those industrial appliances so that we know what flexibility we can also offer um, to the grid operator, which is the one that's managing the, the balancing market. So this is how the whole pooling of demand side flexibility relates to um, time series forecasting. We made it through the first part. 
Second part is going to be what kind of time series are we dealing with and how can we reason about them. And then in the third part, we'll get to the multiple aggregation levels in forecasting. So this is some very raw data, um, relatively high resolution. The bids only need to be made in like an hourly basis. But you see three big industrial resources here. You see an electric boiler, a heat pump, and an oven or a furnace. And you see each of them has their own characteristics. Of course, it's the electricity signal, so typically it doesn't go below zero. And also what you see is a lot of the resources, they have a kind of like a max rated capacity, right? For example, this electricity boiler, you can see it has some heating element in there probably, and if it's ringing at six megawatts, it's never going higher. And you see some kind of like production cycles. So if you look at the below, sample of the furnace, you can really clearly see there's some material, like maybe metal, is loaded into the furnace, then it needs to heat up really hard, it's using a lot of power, and once the metal starts to come to temperature, the power consumption kind of trails off, um, and then whatever next operation, I know it's cast or maybe it's uh, sheet formed, until the next comes in. So this is what you see in the below graph, you see these clear patterns in the electricity consumption. So, this got us thinking. Me, and I have to say the other uh, machine learning engineer that's working a lot on this, uh, Oli, how can we reason about those kinds of time series models? Um, there's this book called Intermittent Demand Forecasting. And by the way, whenever you see a number in the square brackets, it's a reference. So if you think this is interesting, write down the number. At the end, I will show the references, and then you can uh, access uh, the material. So here you see a number of categories of time series. So the, the top left one is called erratic because it's mostly on, but when it's on, it has a relatively high variance. Then the top right one is sometimes on, sometimes off. And when it's on, it's also fluctuating a lot. So high variance or high variability. There's a smooth one, which is almost always on um, and also low variance, and then the bottom one, it's a bit hard to see because it's only on for short periods of time, but this is a greenhouse, and typically the greenhouses, when they're on, they are really steady, so low variance, um, but they're not always on, because if the sun's out, you're not gonna also put on the lights. So we put it in this little diagram. It is not a diagram that we made. It's from the, the book that you can see here. There's basically two axes. One of them is demand interval or intermittence. And the other one is the variance of the non-zero values or erraticness, you could also call it. And in this way, you can classify erratic, lumpy, intermittent, and smooth, uh, smooth as four different series. The thing is, we have a lot of groups of similar resources in our pool. And you can imagine that this erratic and intermittent is really quite difficult to forecast. We have a lot of zeros, and you might not know exactly when it's zero and non-zero. But when you group together resources, typically, it will make them more smooth. So you can see an example of the greenhouses. So if you look at this period, May 17th, on the left, you see three individual greenhouses. On the right, you see a pool of about 100 greenhouses summed together. And you see for the individual ones, there's kind of like a chance. They might have the lights on on that day, or they might turn the lights off on that day. So you can imagine, and this is going to be a bit hand-wavy statistics, but if they have a somewhat similar probability of the decisions they make of when to put the lights on or when to put them off, that distribution that's behind it kind of seeps through if you see the aggregated signal, right? So in the individual ones, it's really hard, binary, zero or one, it's on or off. But if you look at the aggregation, you see a more smooth curve of the, the patterns that the greenhouses make. So this, I want to give one more example of this, also the furnaces. Individually, you see they are really hard to time. 
because they may some of the a lot of the furnaces have the similar pattern of this heating cycle that I just showed, um, but they might have different length, and they might also have different timings. And also, the timing intervals are not consistent. But if you pull them together, you see that a lot of this, for example, the intermittents, so the zeros, they kind of go away, and also the relative variance also get lower. So this is my kind of like uh, proposition. Aggregation promotes smooth smoothness. So if you have erratic, lumpy, or intermittent time series, if you do some aggregation over different levels or over time, then you get a more smooth signal. And typically, smooth signals are easier to forecast than non-smooth signals. There's ways also for doing forecasting on intermittent time series. Um, but usually, it requires some special techniques. The issue is, so for our bid bidding process, usually it's fine if we can just have one bid with regard to the TSO. But if you are operations analyst, maybe you want to say, okay, what happens if I take out this resource, right? So business requires a low level of detail. Um, and if you think of a different example, maybe a store, um, okay, it's nice to know what all the things combined are consuming, but you also want to have some lower level insight of like an individual store. So we have this kind of trade-off between high level of detail on one side and something that's better to forecast on the other side. So the question is, how can we do both at the same time? What strategies are there for getting a forecast on the aggregate level, but also getting the individual forecasts? And I want to discuss four different strategies. The first of, first of them, is called bottom-up forecasting. Um, there's a lot of things you see in the slide, but it's re relatively simple. So if the Ts are the individual time series, then you train a model on each of the time series. They get a forecast for each of the time series. So here there's three time series, three models, three forecasts. You forecast the lowest level first. That's why it's called bottom-up. And then you do an aggregation. And then you have an aggregated forecast. But it does mean you have to deal with intermittent erraticness, all the, the hard stuff, basically. The other way you could do is, is top-down forecasting. So instead of forecasting the individual time series, you first sum all the time series together. And again, I'm taking an example of different groups of time series, but this can also mean over time, right? Over a week or over a month, uh, you could also aggregate. And then you somehow have to distribute down this grouped forecast into the individuals. And the simplest thing you could say is just spread it uniformly, or you could take historical proportions of sites, or there's also some methods where you um, can forecast the proportions if they are changing over time. Of course, it's gonna, not going to give you as much detail, but maybe if you're forecasting for stores and they're all quite similar, this could be a good approach as well. Third approach, if we have bottom up and top down, why not do both at the same time? And this, this field is called forecast reconciliation. So you do both. You have the bottom up forecast, or like the lowest level forecast, and you forecast the highest level. But to make sense towards your stakeholders, you need to find some way to make them match, right? So one uh, example of how you could do this is called minimal trace reconciliation, where you basically define a matrix that says how the lowest level sum up to the higher hierarchical levels in your time series. And then you do some optimization on that matrix to make sure that you get a consistent output. So your output of this is having the lowest level and the highest level um, forecast. And actually, there's a Python package which implement this uh, method and uh, a lot of ones. So if you're interested in that, I would check that out. The final method I want to talk about is called global forecasting. Um, and this is an approach where essentially this is a form of bottom-up, but instead of training individual models for each of your time series, you just basically concat concatenate all of your time series put them in a single model, and then also get outputs 
of uh, the individual forecast. And maybe you want to include like an identifier or something um, as a feature also in this model. For example, the category of the research you could include. And there's a really interesting paper which I recommend, which is called Principles and Algorithms for Forecasting Groups of Time Series, Locality and Globality. Um, I found this a really interesting read because what they are claiming in this paper, you think, okay, if I have just one model to train on lots of different time series, then it's gonna be more restrictive, right? What they claim in this paper is that it's not necessarily more restrictive. And to give you kind of like a layman summary of what they are claiming in the, in the, in the paper is that the local model naturally has a more of a tendency to overfit because it has a shorter history or less samples to train on um, and relatively more model parameters to kind of learn the training data and thus overfit on the test data. Of course, a global model will need more parameters to kind of like achieve the same performance as the local ones. Um, but if you compare overall, then the global model maybe it needs 10 times or 20 times as much parameters as each of the individual local models. But if you have 100 different time series, that's still less kind of like parameters to overfit on your data. That's one. And each of the, if you're having some lag-based model, so your autoregressive model, then for each of the individual time series that you forecast, you can get away with having more lags. So you can include more history into your forecast. And this is basically the premise. In this paper, they play, try to explain why is the global forecasting model doing so good? Because they found in a lot of competitions it was doing quite well. Um, so I recommend it. And there's also a book which also discusses this uh, quite well. So on our, some of our results, um, you see that the performance that we got with the aggregate model actually was quite close to the performance that we got with the global model, even though the aggregate model was doing like a nice, this is compared uh, on the aggregate level. So I'm comparing the forecasting on error on the aggregate level and the nice smooth forecast on the aggregate level got similar performance as kind of like the bottom up global forecasting method. The normal bottom up here, I have to put a bit of a disclaimer, not fully representative because the model that we're comparing there, we also made some other tweaks to it. The point I wanted to trying to make is in our experience, the global method could do as well as forecasting on the kind of like the nice smooth aggregate level. So that was the three parts. We talked a little bit about energy and balancing markets and how they play an important real role in keeping our grid stable. All the things that we have to think about together if we want to move away from fossil fuels. We learned that intermittent time series, uh, this applies to kind of like power series, but it might also be, I think most time series, if you go to a really low level, if you think of the, the sales at a store, if you go down to the minute level, it's also gonna be intermittent, right? Because a small store is not gonna sell something in everything. Um, so they require different approaches from smooth ones, but maybe you can get around it if you do some different level of aggregation. And we learned about what different techniques there exist to make reconciled forecast of the individual and any aggregation of the forecast that you might have. Here's the references slide. Um, take a picture. All the things with the hyperlinks that you can see are openly accessible. Some of the other ones are books. Um, so you'd have to get those. And um, that was my talk. Thank you so much.